Hey, welcome everybody. We've got the April 3rd Tuesday meeting of the OSC dev team. So let's go to the development team agenda here. Uh, let me share my screen as well so you can follow where I am. It looks like uh, Jitsi has changed a little bit. In the Jitsi interface looks like it's changed a little bit. Okay. Is that the same for you guys? Because I have the icons now on the bottom instead of on the top. Screen share. Okay, so you guys can see my screen. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So let's continue. All right. So, so agenda for today: progress reports. So I'll talk a little bit about OSC developers the personal micro factory and the long curve of development and then first robotics Oklahoma meeting John's filling in on a D3D Ohio he's absent Ruslan more work on a piping workbench Michael's working on uh, he's in the background working on the internet part on the the backup storage for OSC so we're getting that all into place then Abe more work on a power cube and Lex I haven't heard from here uh, but he is working uh, the long th nice thread about the filament maker and and the the plastic shredder so that's that's good uh, let's see uh, task allocation can we have somebody take notes Abe maybe you could do that or okay, yeah. okay. sounds good so take notes um, yeah yeah let's do that so on OSC devs hey I just looked at the, some of the numbers if you if you look at uh, the OSC developers page we do have people moving up in numbers so we have uh, one two three and four star developers ie people have completed the full 90 day terms um, two stars for two of the 90 day terms there's three stars well and four stars so um, on the one star we've got Christian who's still in the background he's he's doing our our OSC Linux ISO Io, he's not with us anymore. Joseph, Dixon, Jose, those are all past developers. And two star, we have some past people like Emmanuel and Oliver, and then Ruslan and Herman are still, or Germán are still uh, on the team. And then three star, we got Roberto, who's been on vacation for some time now. Lex is still on, and Abe's going strong here. And four star, Michael's been quite consistent back on the internet issues, and myself as well. So that's that's where you are right now. Um, okay. Uh, team team hours are looking at we're at about like a hundred hours per week uh, or so. So definitely we're gonna grow grow the team as I keep saying, and I think that's gonna happen once once the the immersion program is gonna happen, and also the Hero X that's still in the works. So that's all good. Now as far as the 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 personal micro factory or pretty much that's for the immersion training program that's what we can offer right now the 3d printer with some interchangeable heads so it's this is the personal micro factory it is the basic small tools of the of the micro factory so we've got we definitely have the the capacity developed for 3d printing we have not done the laser cutter the small laser cutter attachment there's plenty of that evidence and and videos on youtube of how to do that using the same tool chains clay extruders are still out that would be good to add a clay extruder head to the platform there are some clay extruders out there uh, I haven't really looked deeply as far as how well documented any of that is I know our friends from most the Michigan open source tech lab they have worked with that so there's possibility there for for getting that tech transfer happening um, but that would be you know if you could bake your own pots and things and clay objects that so so things uh, earthenware or ceramic ware uh, that's useful for some parts and also for practical applications like cups and things so imagine uh, printing out swag for people uh, in our open source little everything store uh, using our own clay printer but you have to bake that though so there's a fur there's a little uh, furnace that's needed for that and then the last head here that we have for the personal micro factory is the CNC circuit mill head which is now well developed and looking forward to we'll run a workshop on that this year and have that included for for circuit milling of all kinds of different circuits so that's very very useful then on top of this we've got the plastic grinder and filament maker that's so so currently we've um, 
As we said, the Thunderhead Tech for Trade one is not available right now. We're working still with the Lyman, which is still a good choice, and, and that can produce a spool of filament every every two hours. So, so in terms of production, that's acceptable, like as a minimum level of production. You can have multiple ones of that to actually produce filament for sale or for use. And then a plastic grinder, the best one we know of is, is from the the Precious Plastic Project by Dave Hackens. So that's that's one that we can definitely use. And um, between David Hackens extruder and the Lyman filament extruder, one comment I do have is Lyman has only got a one half inch screw. So the limitation to that would be the regularity of the of the pellet feed. Like right now, Mr. Lyman uses pellets to feed that. They're very regular, but they're a commercial product. It's not like you can. I'm not sure how well the Lyman filament maker would work with uh, pretty much regrind or just shredded plastic, like from the from the precious plastic shredder. So one way to move on from the filament maker, the Lyman, is to use a larger screw. So I'm actually looking at that here, using a larger screw. The 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 precious plastic uses a one inch screw, whereas the Lyman uses a half inch screw. So obviously, if you've got a one inch screw you can just press much more through that and and Dave's version the precious plastic one they work with regrind so that's good they, they have more of that tool chain developed because always you have to be careful about what you're feeding this and and with Dave's version that is more more uh, more robust in that sense so so there's that to explore okay uh, so that's that's active exploration here as far as what what we end up doing but uh, for yeah I mean there's July June July August where when we'll do various workshops workshops on 3d printers and so forth so we can include the filament maker build in there again so this you know this is all all work takes long time and I just ran into this thing the long nose of innovation I was looking at uh, doing some internet searches and this is actually a useful thing for what what's happening here like in terms of how technology is adapted because we definitely see that at OSC it's like it's taken a long time to to get started as in like only now are we getting to the immersion training where we're trying to very deliberately get more people going on this because by itself it's like we're, we can't escape this invention uh, area here invention refinement augmentation it's a long process and then you start getting traction. But I think to get to that traction, that's where the immersion program comes in. Just more people doing this full time, so so we can actually have a significant impact. So it's just a useful, useful framework because uh, development does take long time. And if unless you get those final steps of refinement, you you always be like in this invention and refinement augmentation stage like you know like with our power cubes for example i mean we've been going through so many different versions but that's just the reality of the game it's it's uh, to get something to a, from a project to a product that's a lot of iteration so it's just a useful framework to look at okay a quick report from uh the first robotics this is that we went katarina and i visited first robotics in Oklahoma I don't have I didn't upload pictures I'll do that um, later uh, so we spoke there we, we actually gave uh, versions of our TED talks there to an audience of 1100 students the event was really nice uh, a lot of the students there are quite quite savvy it was, it was kind of like a bit basically like a big hackers fest kind of a deal they make robots that don't have like really much meaning but they do have great educational value but what we did run into is a lot of um, the organizers and other people and some of the teams like for example there's a guy from from Smithville which is about 45 minutes away from us here who runs a first robotics team uh, and first for if you don't know that's a robotics competition from the elementary to high school level but he's running a team of high school students and he wants to build our tractor so uh, actually by June end of June he's interested in, in, in building the micro tractor so that's a good, great way to prototype if we get their team of students going then that's something that's a totally collaborative effort a team of people outside of factory farm get to do that make some improvements and that would be great we'll see if we could get them going on FreeCAD or not I mean we'll see we'll see if they're up for that but that's that's one good outcome there's a lot of um, so the contacts I made were with 
uh, like for example the tech there's tech centers in Oklahoma the, Oklahoma is actually six hours away from us so it's a little bit of a drive but uh, they have tech centers and there's definitely pro possibilities of uh, with the people that we met there to to promote OSC projects to students so that was a uh, the interesting thing there was that a lot of the people there were very quite very much interested some professors uh, from universities who are involved in first um, several contacts that I'm following up with right now regarding having students do that for student projects master's thesis there's possibilities like we, we typically look for things like master's thesis that's an excellent thing because you know that a student has to put in a lot of hours to some development and why not actually work on something very meaningful like what what we're doing or for even for the tech centers which are basically kind of like technical education for students uh, they have projects projects where where a team of three students for example works for eight months so once again there that's that's a great opportunity for having some serious traction on development so that's that's in the in the works uh, we'll see uh, what what comes out of this but definitely I'm interested in going back down there uh, at the very least to present to one of these tech centers and they've got many of those that's kind of unique how it works in Oklahoma that the way they have the tech centers it's not community colleges it's not high schools it's somewhere in between uh, but it's kind of a unique structure they have down there uh, we could go down there and so possibly do a thing like okay run a 3d printer workshop and then uh, do a presentation so that we can we can get both people building 3d printers as well as running uh, well, possibly joining the dev team or, or or some student project version. So that was that was pretty good. Um, I liked it. Event was quite inspiring. It was it was quite nice um, to see that um, the kind of excitement from the students. They're, these definitely were all kind of like definitely you can see how the leadership qualities in these these young students was were being cultivated as they work on on the teams together and projects. So it was a very nice environment. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so John's log here let's see what he's up to he he can't make the meeting but um, let's see what he's got so let's see um, built the d3 single d3 axis um, working on a CAD yeah we should definitely do so he's um, ready getting ready for the build and definitely wanna we wanna review the CAD to see where we are on the quality control on the CAD so make sure we're building a right thing that's actually gonna work some thoughts uh, expect to be able to remotely see the status of managing my factory so yeah management so that would be the like I, I mentioned on slide 4 there's the Arduino controller Raspberry Pi wireless control open source power supply uh, the Raspberry Pi wireless control is something we can we can connect through the internet to actually uh, using Octoprint there's Octoprint that's open source software we can manage and view the print remotely um, yeah continuous bed printing that's something to consider for the future the, basically when you print like a like on a 45 degree angle there's 3d printers that they basically have a conveyor and you print and they they it's a to totally continuous print so you can print forever uh, that's something to look at in the future perhaps um, yeah, products pop out the other end. The other side of that is having automatic part harvesting. If you have a print bed and a finished part, um, you can simply like bump it off or have a small robotic arm. Like there's a lot of small robotic, open source robotic arms out there. Maybe have a small robotic arm actually pick it off. I was looking at uh, trainable robotic arms, which basically you touch the arm and you move it around, and that arm rem memorizes what you move so it, you can actually train it by physically touching that arm and moving it how you want to do that want to be moved um, that's a great interface moment like if we can get to that um, yeah definitely um, points of development on, on robotic arms and 3d printing working together um, open source Arduino based PLC programmable logical controller someone can program with ladder logic or block diagram I'm not sure what that's referring to because I mean we already have open source Arduino uh, controlling the whole system but okay all right um, Abe do you want to continue on the power cube where you're at right now
Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. So how do you think, you know, how do we uh, accomplish that point? Differentiate them. Uh, 
my work page will only create the stuff and then it is like it is you can open it uh, in uh, all uh, frequent versions and uh, with flamingo it, it, uh, each time uh, a part is shown it will use python code uh, to, to be drawn this is now for this experimental phase a disadvantage but you can also use uh, uh, use uh, the workbench and uh, to adjust your um, your cut the drawing and afterwards you can convert everything to solid and then you don't, uh, don't have uh, the dependency okay so it sounds like the flamingo code does a lot more redrawing every time and maybe uh, that, that's slower but I think you were saying that the flamingo code the way it does it it redraws some of the, the parts with just the Python code every time you want to produce something different. Is that... I would not say it is slow, slower because a large portion of a free cut workbenches work in this way. Yeah, it's it's all Python, I guess, right? So Yes, yes. The only thing is, uh, for example, uh, if you would save uh, the Flamingo implementation of an able, that means you will save like different parameters, which describe a standard info. And then this is saved, not, not the way how, I suppose, not uh, the shape, but this is six parameters. And when, when you look at this part, when you open it again, uh, my code will, uh, and code of Flamingo will translate uh, these parameters into a shape. Yeah, I think I saw uh, just in order certain specific parameters was all you needed uh, to draw the shape. And I assume that's what's being stored in like the, the, the CSV files, is those yes. particular parameters that you need to draw any part. Okay. Yes. I will, I will change uh, the longer elbow once more. Oh no, I, I think it's okay already. I recently changed the uh, elbows. For example, I replace uh, inner uh, diameter through thickness of the walls. So, I guess one more advanced thing I was wondering is how hard, I mean, obviously you're using uh, some Python and stuff to do, creating the workbench, you're drawing up, uh, get some GUI interface stuff. Uh, is it much harder to move from like doing CSV to maybe doing something more complicated with the GUI where you can enter more data to generate the parts, like just by entering the data with the... Uh, uh, po possibly the it's uh, not... Um, wait, I need to think about it. Um, the more complex it will become, uh, then I suppose it's easier to draw it directly in FreeCAD. Uh, the only benefits of automatization is if you have something which is uh, frequently used. Yeah. And uh, yes, I follow some standards, or, or I think I follow some standards because I use uh, data from you know, from a catalog. And, uh, and I think people who sell this kind of stuff, they know how to describe uh, Yeah, one thing running to FreeCAD a lot is, is drawn a lot of similar stuff, and I've tried to make parts where it's more edible, so I can always come back and, yeah, sometimes you can design parts in different ways, you know, obviously, and draw them with different methods. Mm -hmm. So, and some are more edible than the others, but it would almost be nice in some cases to have a, um, well, a macro code made, I that in code too, but um, just to be able to have like a tool that would draw a bunch of different parts by entering, uh, or similar parts by entering different dimensions, you know, right into a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, into a window of the GUI and FreeCAD, if it could. Hey, welcome everybody. We've no, got the... I know that that probably involves a bit more work with the API and, and a lot more Python code, probably some. Well, there is also a possibility for a single part that you can use a spreadsheet uh, as a source for parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's true. You just, 
Yeah, set up the spreadsheet right, and you can just generate, yeah. Okay, it's a variety of sizes, yeah. It's supported in FreeCAD. But you, you need to, to calculate, uh, uh, to use ap appropriate formulas. If you have a uh, uh, detailed ideas, maybe I can uh, implement some of this. Uh, yeah, that's or just I can uh, help you to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I need to um, <laughs> learn more Python myself. I've attempted to do a little before, and I haven't got that into that deeper because it's probably uh, so much more productive than just trying to draw stuff by hand all the time. Um, but I haven't spent enough time uh, learning Python, although, um, yeah, I, there's different opportunities to do that, but I've got to it enough. Um, it looks like there's there's enough um, similarities to some of the things you're drawing. I think that it shouldn't be that hard to do it um, the way I think it'll look better for MPT. Um, what is MPT? Uh, the National Pipe Thread Standard. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, which I guess yeah. is uh, Imperial Standard, but yeah, it's used uh, for the metal pipes, I think more. Um, and I don't know how detailed you need to get with that. I know some of the MPT parts, they even have the, uh, the taper, the threads, because the threads in MPT are actually on a taper. But the other parts I've been drawing, I haven't done that, but I don't know how hard that's the implement. Obviously, we don't want to draw the, the thread, it's just too much, but um, I don't think other, it's hard. other people... Yeah, I think it's harder than, than BBC. I think the only reason that we want the detail of things like the taper and all that in the future was, was if eventually some machines are made to, to actually machine some of the stuff, right? So. That, that's not an immediate priority for that much detail, so. But it'd be nice to be able to implement some of that easily. Okay, so, yeah, I guess on the, the power cube, we still get some plumbing details, but we're kind of slow on that, but the, I, I think it's, pretty close, and then before the next stuff is, is more about the tractor. Um, one of the big issues, too, I was looking back at, I think I'm going to go back to do more file work, I'm pretty close on the CAD stuff, but putting the CAD and so on first um, the results in, in the issue, I think last week we were talking about the, the file management, just like the template and everything, and getting the burn down right, mm -hmm. and to get that burn down right to be useful to display everything it's like definitely have to make sure that all that file method stuff is kind of done first and that that's like a continuous thing too sometimes because things change um so i'm gonna actually try to concentrate more on cleaning up some of that file stuff figuring that out um because the the cad gets done but the other stuff is, is uh, uh, got a lot more technical details that need to be figured out in there. So, I don't know, we, I think, let's see, I think there's a page, I think March and last week you made a page on the wiki about managing the, the files for the burn down, so I to look into that more. Um, now, what's the issue with the burn down? I mean, what's what's the, can well, you summarize? Getting an overall, um, method protocol because if you don't do work in certain steps then um, the burn down isn't going to quite work it's not going to work very well uh, if you do the CAD before you do certain file management stuff then uh, there's going to be some ordered operations of course a lot of it would be ideally done in parallel but um, that no, file but I mean stuff has to be prioritize first so that what do you mean by uh, file stuff um keeping all the files related that are linked into the template and everything that's generating the burn down but there's a whole bunch of other files that feed into that template so 
Oh, yeah, but hold on. Really... All it's all all we're doing in the template is parsing the last column, right? Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. ma matter well, what the links are. You're manually filling in the the completion status, and all all the yeah. burn down is doing just reading off your comp completion status, so you don't have to update a graph. Yeah, it's just just numbers. So, but you know, getting entering numbers um, to get more accurate with your numbers and so on, you kind of have to do I think all the other file management stuff continuously ahead of the other stuff. That way, you get get reasonable numbers because it's hard to you, the human element is is actually predicting what the numbers are still, right? So yeah, yeah, um, you kind of use your no, judgment, I'm, yeah up and down, but if we don't have like a, a real good workflow for that in getting the files, um, a bunch of those other files, you know, changed, or if they need to be changed in the right order, then that, that's always going to be an issue with estimating the, the numbers for the, the template that calculates the, the burn down chart. So. Well, I mean, you, you click on a link that you have as the entry, right, and a in any development template you've got the work product link right let's see so let's take a look at one so it, say you have this simplified development template uh, column C is link to work product so that's your link um, I mean is the issue that of how do you translate oh what's the level of completion like one through ten for that well yeah yeah I mean well I mean you can take I mean estimate that right I mean yeah. but why is that I mean I'm not really seeing how is that difficult I mean say you got 3d CAD yeah. you know you it's you just give it the general amount like if it's totally yeah. complete it's 10 if it's just started it's one and then it's somewhere in between like if you think you're halfway it's like five you know just kind yeah, of estimate I think, the percentage. I think we were saying last week you could go up and down if we realize something else needs to be changed. Oh no, uh, I mean, what I was saying is that, yeah, I mean, I mean that's that's true. Like if you think that you are complete, but but you discovered something along the road that makes it no, this has actually got a lot of work. I mean that's that's how it could, that's how it could change. But it's just kind of still qualitative, almost. Partly. I guess part of the issue is, is you could end up like there's a bunch of links that you've added probably just linked to the old documents because they're right. complete. And you just don't need to do a lot of that. But somewhere through the process, you might end up realizing, oh, I need to go back and actually change this, so we have to copy. Yeah, files yeah. If and that's all that yeah, exactly, exactly. But right. that's but that's the point. I mean, yeah, you have to keep track of that very carefully. Like, I mean, this is this this development <laughs> template is very information rich you, you can click on each link and then you have to see what's in there so I mean there's no shortcut to really managing this properly I mean there's just so many different tasks need to be done and tracked yeah yeah well, I mean basically I mean do the best you can on that it's it's kinda yeah uh, just to help us track where we are in general you know a matter of kind of prioritizing that. I mean, we always have the issue with prioritizing um, certain uh, work over the other stuff. The, the documentation tends to fall behind that. That's right. I mean, that's the issue. Like, we, we do some work and and then we might not update the development template, but that's that's the that's a discipline we have to build up, is that we go where whatever exists is represented in a template. Otherwise, I mean, the, the template should be a place where you say, okay, if it doesn't exist in there, that means it's not done. It's supposed to be that summary. But yeah, I mean, point is that all this takes time to manage and process. And once again, the reason why we really need a solid team that's full-time, you know, a bunch of full-time people is really, like, to, to really accelerate yeah. and make it proper, you know? I don't know if there's something you could write out, like a specific protocol to, to kind of follow for work though of making sure that uh, mm -hmm. some of the documentation is done ahead of uh, uh, with with some of the other work but yeah it's it's kind of a, a balancing act so 
Yeah. Let's see. There is a there is a page on the wiki called Burn Down Graph Protocol. What about? I mean, there should be probably a page called Documentation Standards. Let's see what's under that right now. Yeah, I mean that's it's a big page. Yeah, yeah, that needs to be a. That's a lot of old. Oh man, tell me about it. A lot of old stuff. It's got like all the theory, but but as far as actually doing it, I think we have to settle on a. Okay, here's a basic procedure for all the developers. You know, like okay, uh, just yeah. summarizing the main points that need to be be there. Yep. Yeah, sometimes that stuff is a little bit long, and so. Yeah, stuff gets missed, especially if you got if you actually get some new people coming in. Like we need some simpler outlines that yeah. uh, can quickly get people to follow, you know, uh, methods to to do the documentation and then the work and. Yeah, I think what uh, what we need is something like a developer's manual. You know, here's your operations manual for when you're a developer, <laughs> what you should do. Uh, just making sure that you do on a regular basis yeah yeah we need we need to update some of that that's some of the stuff I want to update for like once we get the immersion program so we're very clear on that and um, all of that if you want to take a stab at it stab at it go ahead but yeah oh yeah over I'll time it's look through that more I think this week and um... I think I think you made a page on that last week too that I'll look at, but um, see, there was uh, yeah. I try to boil that down, but it it can be hard to make that into a, a singular kind of defined method because it, it varies so much for certain projects. So. Right, right, um, and the uh, right, and then that that becomes skill. It's basically process management skill that one one can figure out which is which steps are relevant and which aren't. That's kind of getting into project management skill, yeah, which it's, novices yeah, are not going to really have. Mm -hmm. Learning curve to that. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, um, Abe, is that? Uh, you, did you want to say anything more about the power cube? Um, I think that's about it. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'm getting close on the plumbing, um, and then then eventually we'll get to the back to the detractor design, and then yeah, uh, how that how that fits together yet. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Good job for being consistent and continuing on. I think it's getting close. All right. Um, hey, Ruslan, you want to uh, summarize what you, your progress? Well, I'm in the integration. <laughs> okay. That's all. Oh. Uh, I, um, I try now to, to improve. Um, oh, wait. How oh, I better describe it? I improved my workbench, adjust parameters, and uh, I, I made a little video. Yeah. Um, the developer of uh, Flamingo um, had some special command uh, just recently, I think on this weekend, uh -huh. uh, which helps to join the different uh, parts, Flamingo parts, together. And because uh, part of, uh, of new implementation of my fittings based on Flamingo, that, that mm -hmm. means if those are Flamingo objects, you can use uh, his commands together with uh, our parts. And in this video, short video, about two minutes, uh -huh. I dem demonstrate how to use it. And the, uh, there is also an entry on in the uh, FreeCAD forum where the Odd Topus, uh, the developer of Flamingo, um, describe uh, this feature. 
Okay. Uh, if, can you see my screen right now, for example? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, so I'm in an OSC piping workbench. You know, say I want to try to do the do something. Uh, let's say create coupling. So I should be able to. Well, actually, let me show you one. I was, I think, I was doing this one. Sweep elbow, do an eight-inch one. Okay, I pressed okay. What happened here? Um, I'm not seeing anything. Is that a bug you now? Need to, you need to first to select flamingo. Uh, uh, output pop types. In my manual, I mentioned. Okay. So I'm in, so I'm in OSC piping workbench, and wh where do I select that? Uh, where is uh, the window, the dialog? Okay, so yes, so yes, select this flamingo. This one. Yeah. Yes. Then you need to select flamingo. Okay. And then you, when you press OK, it, it is now a flamingo part. Okay. Now can, now so can now I got it. Uh, change parameters. Okay. And the parameters would be here. Like, for example. This one. H. You, you need to increase the dimension H no. uh, Okay. Because this part is physically not possible. Okay, there there is a modification, okay. Okay. So what what happens when I don't select it? It's just is that something you'll take out of there or is that is there another function for that? No, if you do, we don't select uh, flamingo you will get uh, either a part consisting of standard parts uh -huh. or a solid. Then you um, you will lose the flexibility, but it will, uh, I suppose, uh, compatible with uh, any free cat. Okay. Okay. So let's let's see. But why was it like? Okay. Say when I selected that before, and I had solid selected, um, and then I click OK. If you don't need to change parameters, uh, this is perfectly uh, reasonable. Okay, so but, but, but what's happening? I'm not seeing anything happened. I'm clicking OK. You found, you found the bug. <laughs> um, it, it should. But if, if not, then I have a bug. View. How old is the version which you use? No, I just downloaded it. I just git get cloned it. When? Just now. Just five minutes ago. Okay, you found you found the bug. Okay. It should create. Maybe try another elbow. No, not the sweep one. Okay, let's. The long one. Okay, so let's just do a half inch elbow here. Okay. Let's see, did it give you, it? You don't have pictures. This is strange. Right. This is strange. Uh, can you share your screen to see how it looks? Uh, does it matter if I'm using FreeCAD daily or? I, I use uh, zero points. Okay. This is how it looks. See, are you sharing your screen? I also have the whole have problem with uh, with solid. But the uh, one I tried, I want to try a different one. Uh, by the way, have you tried uh, this elbow, not the sweep one, just a normal one? Normal elbow. Let's see. Yeah, let's just try one inch. There it is. Yeah, that's working. 
Mm-hmm. Adds a sweep elbow, adds an elbow. You can also create solid parts. Yeah, wow, you got a lot of different options here. We are not short of options. 10 inch, 90 degree. Okay. And and the difference between solid and parts is what? Uh, solid, uh, you, you cannot change it. It just... Uh, by, by the way, you, you have parts and uh, the, you can create uh, each... It is composition of parts. And you can uh, change, for example, some... Uh, individual part. parameters. Uh -huh. the, the socket of the elbow, those are cylinders. Uh -huh. And you create them, but you can change them. It's not that convenient like a flamingo one when, when you change, your, uh, let's say, standard parameters. Yeah. And uh, nevertheless, it's more flexible. Uh, or you can uh, modify it, um, you can add, uh, maybe remove only part of the uh, one part of the part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the solid, no. it, just, uh, let's say, like, snapshot of, of, the, of, the, of this part. And, um, mm -hmm. it's flexible. Okay, okay. Uh, how are you doing on documenting all this stuff? That's, is that, um, is that, was that your next step, or have you documented some of the usage? How far are you on a documentation of how to use the OSC piping workbench? No, oh, there is a dedicated wiki page for OSC piping workbench. Uh, workbench. Oh, on OSC. Right, right. So that's good. Um, right, like for example, the distinction between, between parts, flamingo, and solid. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, no, uh, this I have to document. Right, right. Okay, I, uh, okay. I need uh, to, uh, to bring uh, the parts to a stable state. Okay. Because now, now I'm changing parameters because uh, I'm not sure which to use. Uh, fortunately, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can compare it uh, with uh, more advanced uh, workbenches like, like Flamingo and uh, take uh, their approach. But I'm, I'm still learning. Okay. I suppose it already works and uh, I will not add a, a lot of stuff. Yeah. It, it is sufficient. Probably uh, I add more documentation. And also uh, documentation about uh, code. Uh, okay. One, one of the items or questions I want. Ask, what about support for uh, source code and formulas in our on our wiki pages? Uh, support for so source code and math. Yes. Uh, yeah. In, in the documentation, wiki documentation, there is documentation how to use math formulas. But they, they right. So we, I emailed uh, Michael about that. I haven't seen a response yet. Yeah. So let's let's make, so um, and when you when you want code support so basically where it doesn't it treats it as a just as you see right as opposed to marking it up uh, for example but but also a syntax highlighting for example if i want to explain this is part in, in my python code responsible for aha uh, uh -huh. does does wiki media wiki have good support for that function they have a plugin for that? I think he's talking about Wikimedia plugins. I think they have plugins. Um, like Wikipedia has ways to display, I think it's kind of more graphical, but it's different symbols in a graph. Yep, yep. Um, directly, like, um, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, Ruslan, uh, 
yeah, if you can specify some some of what you're looking at. I CC'd you on that email to Michael, right? I copied you on the email to Michael when we were asking him. Yeah, so if you want to just respond with some specifics of what, what you'd need, what would make it easier for you. And let's see if, if we can... Uh, mathematical formulas and yeah. uh, support for uh, displaying of source code. Yeah. In for example, Python. It seems like we will use a lot of Python. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, let's see what, what Michael responds there so we can continue that discussion there. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it is an important part also yeah. to teach people how to uh, make their own tools or uh, uh, if for some reason I will not be able to uh, con uh, to continue right uh, or, uh, then um, and, and someone really need this kind of tool then uh, I need to teach people uh, to use and to modify yeah. uh, my code yeah definitely uh, it has also some mathematical, uh, some simple but thematic components. When you create uh, these parts, uh, you do some uh, vector and trigonometry calculation. Uh, at school level, nevertheless, it may be easier to uh, to explain it on wiki pages. Yeah. So, right. Well. Definitely, definitely. That's we want to teach people. Um, Another question. So, for example, when I say when I select the cross, we just have the solid there. So, is that are you still going to do the flamingo and other versions on that, or you just want solid for that? Uh, that means uh, this is the only part where I did the implement uh, flamingo, but I will also change the other. Uh, I'm not sure. M maybe I will remove cross completely because I don't think it's something which is uh, widely used. No, I mean you don't want to remove it just because we don't use it often. I mean. It's no, we do use it sometimes. Definitely, we use it. Okay, then, then I will add a uh, so for it. I will make it uh, less general because I think uh, I think I need uh, to stop somewhere, and when I introduce too many parameters, it just became unclear. Uh huh. Uh, so you're saying you want to remove the number of options? Uh, yes. Like, for example? For example, which ones? Uh, it, it, for example, the cross, when you click on the cross. Yep. Yep. Let's see. And Oh, yeah, you got... You it's uh, very asymmetrical. Or it's possible to have, <laughs> to have it very asymmetrical. But right. But then I thought, okay... Uh, maybe it's not necessary. Well, I'm pretty sure you will not buy this kind of cross, but there is a possibility right. to, to print. Right. This. And then I thought, okay, maybe if you can uh, print it, it would be, would be but uh, uh, there is a price for too much information, too much generalization. You just don't Right, and is there a way to make right? But what if what if the first ones, like the best way would be you have the first ones are the the ones that are. I think you have that right there. I mean, half by half, right? One and three or four. Nevertheless, if you need to create a CSV file, you will. Uh, for example, for the parameter G, you, you need uh, to have four same parameters if your cross is just a normal one. Maybe I can add some logic to which will distinguish uh, if there is one parameter and there is no other. But I don't think it's too, um, yeah. too special uh, yeah. to use. Right. It, will, it is not necessary. But I will uh, make this. Um, general, but not very general one, which is still possible to buy. Yeah. Just in the case when someone, maybe in the next five years, will, uh -huh. uh, 
decide that uh, this generalization is not enough, I can uh, create a special one. Right, but if you already did that, why not just filter the most common ones to the top and just keep everything else? I mean, it doesn't. Does it cost us anything to do that outside of a CSV file? Okay, but I mean, if you have them on, at the top, then um, it's not. Seems like that's acceptable. If you can pick out, okay, you got the main one, like a half by half cross, so forth. Uh, you don't think that's? Oh, uh, I. I just want to, to remove some of them. Yeah. Not, not all of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Just, uh, until the point when. Buy the part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, there are some. Uh, you can, for example, have uh, one uh, uh, one part for horizontal part and another part for vertical one. Right. This, this kind of crosses they exist. Okay. Where did you get the most general? Like, for example, you've got so many parameters here, like ten of them or so, or ten I or more. Them. Oh, you you created that. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so you do have some good feature creep there. <laughs> okay, I thought that was actually the those were some standard features that you get commercially, but okay, okay. No, it is there is a lot of options. But I mean, it, it for example would be useful. I mean, I could see cases where say you got a cross and you just want little outlets on the top and bottom, uh the non-symmetric crosses, they would be useful sometimes but yeah you really do have a lot of options but there not all of them. right maybe in some, but in some cases yes but uh, no I not think it's, um, typically not four typically but definitely but definitely something like where you have the main like the m g1 g3 like that those ones we have the main one the same and the top and bottom the same those would be useful cases definitely yes yes i have a yeah. I guess, okay. Uh, as, the, as a reference point, uh, uh, description of the parts by uh, Ethnoplastics. Yep. This is the name. All right. Well, definitely. Yeah, we we could uh, remove a little bit of the feature creep, and uh, otherwise, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty thorough. Yeah. Let's see uh, that nice little video of yours here uh, we should play it for the audience let's see um, now this is a video about the video what you are recording right video. oh yeah in that's right video, within the video right right let's see if it's um how come I can't get that going? Let's see, uh, maybe... Let's see if it... Okay, that's awesome. That's good. How many of them do you go through? You go through all of them or just some of them? Um, this is not how to create part, this is uh, how to move the part. Oh, okay. New flamingo Moving robots. parts. This is what I wanted uh, to make myself. Okay. But uh, the guy from uh, Flamingo uh, implemented it uh, for his uh, workbench and uh, because I use uh, his. Uh, Okay. It's uh, really nice. You, you you just click on uh, uh, two ends of, of each part, and they will will be adjusted. Okay. There are still some bugs, nevertheless. It's a nice feature. And okay. I don't do it myself. That sounds good. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, that's that's pretty good then. Um, anything else? Questions. Yes. Uh, um, 
Unique description and tree view? Uh, w when you want to do buy something uh -huh. uh, in catalogs, yeah. you have uh, serial number versus part number. Uh, yes, I need just an English wo word. Um, what, what is confusing for me, can also part number be different, uh, uh, not necessarily a number? Right. Is I mean, it it yeah, sometimes, uh, especially serial numbers, they often include letters to. But that, uh, it's just a English question. It's still a part number. Yes. That okay. Can, yeah. Make the. Yeah, the data can be anything. I'm just looking for, for the code name of my, of my CV as file. But I was confused uh, whether it's always a number. But thank you. Then I will call it probably part number. Is, is it okay? I think or so. Yeah. Yeah, we could go forward with that. Okay. Mm hmm. And serial number could be something different. When you have, you can have probably things with one part number of the same time, but different serial numbers which represent the object itself serial numbers typically apply don't they typically apply more to larger products when you're say manufacturing and then you're just keeping track of which which of the same you're manufacturing which which of the same it is so it's more for record keeping of inventory and stuff like that yeah like for example, once we have a bunch of 3D printers that we're we're producing out there, we should put a serial number on them so that we know who has what copy of the the machine. You know, what what version It'll correspond to to time, which corresponds to versions probably. Yeah, no, that's a whole field of, of endeavor to keep track. Okay. Um, Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. That sounds good. And let's see, um Josh, Josh, you're you're in the background here. Uh any comments? Uh yeah, it's it's been a little while, sorry, I've been busy with some other projects, but yeah. uh yeah, I got finally got around to looking at your email about looking at the micro tractor. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to kind of pick up some development there and you know, get that going for, you're talking August, would be a potential build, another build. So um, yeah, I, you know, there's a decent bit of work there, but I mean, we had a really close product in the first place. Um, right. So, Do yeah. you have a list of tasks that we, we can move on? Is that pretty clear at this point or? Because I mean, uh, let me double check. You know, uh, you know, update the frame. I've got. I'll just read them out real quick. Update the frame. Uh, kind of on the changes we did. Update the tensioner mechanism. Uh, update the motor assembly and its mounting. Mm-hmm. 
uh, update the loader arm pivot points um, and kind of geometry there. Uh, we're supposed to. So we were looking at adding adding on those little triangle pieces that we kind of uh, welded on. Uh, right. By changing. Uh, did you want to? Yeah, probably the easiest thing to do there was to raise the geometry of the parts so we don't need to add those those triangle pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I, I think it'd be better to accommodate that loader arm, loader arm geometry better. Even right. We don't have that document the last time. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, and then let's see what else is the last couple of things. Uh, new mount of the curl cylinder on the bucket. Uh, Update the lower arm cylinder mount, and update the bucket, and then add the operator platform. Those are kind of yeah. just the big ones we have. Yeah, there's a lot of lot of, lot there. Probably the biggest, most important is the loader arm geometry, with all the proper yep. cylinder mounting, and then the mounting of the tensioner slash motors, which we we completely kind of well, not completely, but we definitely changed that. Mm -hmm because of the spacing issues yep yeah no if you if you'd have time Yeah, you could. Uh, template, and then that would just be a guide that mm -hmm. you could then use for your oxygen torch or something. Yeah, that's a, that's it. another possibility. Yeah, that's a way to do it. Just a simple pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about you know that that was probably one of the things that took spent like two days with people just grinding on those things. If you can get really really close shape on the first couple cuts, um, yeah, that that would save a huge amount of time. So. And also just having a torch table. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, how's the how's the tractor holding up so far? Well, I mean, haven't used it. It's, I mean, it's been pretty much winter this whole yeah. time, so we haven't been using it. But, yeah, I mean, last fall it was it was good. It was pretty good. I mean, wasn't any issues. One thing that was, one actually, one weird thing was um, when curling, when releasing the bucket, Somehow the buck, like one cylinder would go down and the other one wouldn't, and I I could not, still could not figure out what it, what that was. Sometimes you you curled the cylinder down and just would not go down for some reason, and it would come and go. Uh, so that's I still don't know what that was. It could be some weird artifacts of quick couplers or something, or uh, but I I know I've had back on a brick press weird artifacts where. If you have too many quick couplers, sometimes the ball in the quick coupler gets stuck because of pressure from different parts of the system. And that's the only thing I can think of, but I, I can't really think of, I can't really tell where, more specifically where that is. That's one possibility, but, uh, so just one artifact on just the hydraulic control, but, but beyond that, it was, it was pretty good. And then, of course, we talked about the uh, potential of, increasing the pressure or reducing the the sprocket by a couple of teeth or one or two teeth so we get actually like 30 percent more torque to be able to, to to turn around more easily that's the that's the other thing we we talked about um that would be the only like to make it 
totally like product level I do want that that part where you can literally like just spin in place I think that's important for some tight when you're in a tight space that's I think that's pretty important so that the part of uh, having more torque would be uh, one thing to resolve as well yeah yeah but we have to think about really how to do was, that it was like too fast in the first place anyway right like, that part we solved by just speed control but that still didn't address the fact that after the power cube was on and the loader and bucket were on when we tested it first you can spin in place very easily but then after all the other weight was put on you you couldn't do that anymore so after the bucket was in place and the st platform uh, couldn't couldn't do it anymore if I'm I'm standing on it on the platform with a bucket couldn't do the 360s in place so uh, I think it's just marginally a little bit too little torque and I know that when that happened the, the the machine would stall so we don't have enough torque for for the motors so still going to a slightly smaller pump which right now we're doing forget what we're doing I think we got a 0.65 cubic inch pump or something like that um, but that plus the the sprockets as we can still get the sprocket a little smaller and still still be okay like to get like 30 percent right from the sprocket itself so I would say if we build the next one we want to go from that eight tooth sprocket to a six tooth sprocket which will be correspondingly smaller mm-hmm yeah Now, of course, the other other way to go about that would be to to find motors that just have a little bit more torque. But you know that would be that's that's another option. But I mean, the motors that we have right now are nice and inexpensive and pretty good. So I don't know if we can find. We'd have to just start another search for parts if we wanted to change motors. But I mean, we, we should we should try to make it work with what we have since we've got experience with these already. So to go to the next motor, that would involve more testing and complication. Yep. So, quick question on that. Uh, you said that speed control was you know, how we were dealing with it like, being too fast. Yeah, that, yeah. That's just a diversion, right? Of yeah. Fluid, so there's like less power going to the motor, right? Right. Uh, less fluid going to the motor because we're just uh, dividing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, if we do end up with like, yeah, you're Right. And then you can still retain it at lower, lower uh, speeds because, like, you just wanted to kind of give it some, give it some juice and not have it take off, on you, but then also be able to kind of, yeah, kind of move slowly. Have you ever thought of? Is there any idea of like a sort of gearbox or something as well? Or that's probably just adds a lot more complication. It does add a lot more complication, but I mean, that's people do do that. The the good thing about hydraulics is if the motors are strong enough, you don't really need that gearbox. I mean, that's the advantage, because otherwise that's a wearable part. Uh, so that definitely would not be pr preferred. If if we're going to go to a gearbox, I would rather look for another motor, you know? Is the... What's the... It's the door thing, like, it doesn't have a gearbox, does it? It's just... I don't think so. I think they're also they're also direct drive yeah and they have they control speed by by flow it says ah this is on one of the dingoes it says two ground speeds yeah yeah that might be two flow levels i think yeah. i don't think uh, i remember vaguely i i don't think they had a gearbox in their system but i might yeah. be wrong on that yeah i mean you could just have a system where it's like I don't know, can you, can you switch while you're driving, right? Like, yeah, you could. You have a, okay, so it would you have, could. like, you have some diversion that's happening at a lower speed, and then just say, all right, that, once we get to this other speed, don't divert. And then you would get a lot more power, right? Well, I mean, uh, to to change it on a go, you'd have to have the lever for, for the flow control valve in front of you, and then you would just change that to change the speed as, a, as you're going. But you typically don't need to change speed as you're going. Be, um, well, 
I mean, dep depends what you're doing. If you do want to change in mid course, the thing that we can do is right now with the components we have on it already is the flow control valve where you just switch it to higher or lower flow using this uh, dial or well, this lever that you just uh, turn from side to side that's that's yeah okay. um yeah. Yeah, that's that's my my least knowledgeable area of, you know, is, is this is the hydraulic system so right right and based on what we know right now yeah um we'd have to look at the exact numbers like we say okay if you got uh, there's simple formulas that you say if you got s such a size of a motor based on such and such flow it will spin so fast so we have to go through that and based on what we know right now we we know that okay the current speeds are good uh, what happens when we use for example an even smaller pump we would go slower but we would have more torque available so we kind of have to scratch our head on those numbers calculate them and say okay is that acceptable like you know we know that let's say about like two miles per hour that's a really good speed or like four miles per hour that's pretty fast for a machine like this but if you get down to like half a mile per hour Okay, that might be pretty slow. So you have to look at actually all those numbers and kind of scratch our head and and um, see what's best. But right now, definitely would be advisable to go from the eight to six. That we we can possibly do that as step one. We say okay, now we we just needed more torque on the turning part, so we we get the thirty percent more by going from eight tooth to six tooth, and that might solve it. And then we can say okay, this actually works good. And if not, then we would go to to a smaller pump, which would be just slightly slower, but would give us more torque, and wouldn't stall. Because because right now I'm actually stalling, when uh, okay. when I do the 360 in place. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so, just it's like marginal. It's it, I mean 10, 20, 30 percent. That might be enough to get it over. So you, it's actually not not stalling anymore. Yep. Yeah. I remember that uh, micro tractor made was. Oh, it's not this one. It's. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so you're talking about the pump. Right. Versus. On a power cube. The, yep. Yeah. Um, and you know that power cube is going to be something that uh, it sounds like you know, this already. Yeah, Abe's working on the one that we can plug in four other power cubes into because it's got the one is the the big reservoir and then we can plug in four other power cubes into that as a source of fluid so that each power cube doesn't have to have its own tank, which is the complicated part. So that we could have tiny power cubes for more power. Like we're we're working on the one where we can have 80, 80 horsepower with five power cubes. Just modular, super modular. Where the power cubes are just pretty much engine pump combo. Mm hmm Cool. Yeah. Wow. There's no option for like if you wanted to just have a bigger tractor that was slower and just using one power cube, but then like having some system that has like because basically it's just is it fluid flow or is it fluid like pressure? Uh, the important thing is, okay, the pressure, okay, say so you got a 3,000 PSI pump, you just got one of them. Pressure is the important part. Like, for example, the tiny power cube, which Tom was working on, which is just a solar panel-based one, it's got a very tiny pump, but it still produces 3,000 PSI. That's the beauty of it. Uh, typically they you get that high PSI so you can still that little power cube can drive an entire tractor but it's very slow very very slow but that's the that's the whole point how a, a, a solar panel can drive one of our tractors and we've done that we, we've run the micro power cube 
and we put it on a big tractor and it would move like 14 feet per minute or so uh, so that's the the pressure is there the flow is what's gonna determine the speed pretty much yeah okay. the flow is, is kind of roughly related to the speed yeah Whereas yeah whether or not a dude does something is kind of related to the pressure right 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 it's like if you don't have a certain enough pressure you're just not going to be able to do that thing in the first place it's just going to sit there right right Mm -hmm. Alright, yeah. Sorry, that's just kind of getting the, the rough idea of how the Yeah, works. like, you know, like they have a small hydraulic pump, like say an iron worker machine. You're just putting out a lot, a lot of force. Like, think of a, think of it as you've got a jack. Jack works similarly. A hand, hand pump jack for a car or something. That's a hydraulic jack. It's got huge pressure but the flow is very very low you can do it with your hand but you still get this huge pressure generated so you can lift a car with a hydraulic jack well you're not moving it fast you're moving it very slowly up up mm -hmm. right yeah, that, that iron worker you had there is a very very useful tool i didn't realize how <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely a very useful tool. It can cut steel like butter here. So, so you know where you, you got all the files. You know where they are, right? On um, it's still uh, the same. Yeah, let's see. The, the latest the same. version was the 1710, right? I think that was the last version. Microtrack, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Version 1710, if that's correct. All the files are there. Yeah, I mean, just having built it up, it, it's definitely a lot more simple of a system than I thought it was in the beginning. Right. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, cool. Uh, is there any plans to build another version, or like a small modified version, or um, kind of a mock-up before we do a well, actual okay. build again? Or so the thing we've been talking about, I mentioned the open source microfactory uh, today on slide four, did you see that? Uh, I think I missed that. Part. Okay, you missed that. But the point about the open, the personal microfactory. So um, the idea is that just with a three D printer, a small laser head, like a four or five watt laser, a, a, a four watt laser can actually cut one eighth inch wood or like cardboard between three D printing and laser cutting of cardboard you can actually make an entire mock-up of this thing at in a small scale so you can completely completely test that with you print out your little cylinder you cut out your box beam tubing and then you can just glue it or tape it together um, there's a page on the wiki I believe it's called OSC let's see OSC rapid prototyping but the point is, before the the proper thing to do, if to make sure that everything works, now given that we know exactly what the motors are, because that was the big question from last time that we just didn't have a good file for the motor. Um, take a look at, for example, OSC rapid prototyping. I show the, okay, look at this link here, but the flat cutouts and I show that on the, in the bottom there the flat cutouts so one you can for example prototype the CB press out of flat cutouts of plywood uh, laser cut or you can do like the laser cutting of the little materials uh, basically paper or cardboard or wood and you can make an absolute complete accurate model that would be the proper thing to do so we're not wasting any metal or time and that's why we actually want to do the the small the personal micro factory one of its function is not only that you can do 3d printing or little laser cutting or like the cnc circuit milling but that's relevant to real scale model prototyping and that's how we can involve a lot of people remotely i mentioned in another meeting that we'd also like to start physical like 
design jams or like uh, extreme design sprints where we go to a location we have these 3d printers laser cutters maybe CNC circuit mills we build some of those and then we can prototype real stuff so between FreeCAD and, and scale prototyping we can get a lot of uh, accurate models prototyped and then we when we build it we just minimize the number of surprises that come about so that would be the proper way uh, to go about a prototyping effort um, so I mean one thing that I would really suggest I mean if possible is that you would build yourself the the D3D or get your hands on a 3D printer and a small laser head on top of a 3D printer we can we can retrofit that readily there's a lot of info on that on the internet so that's something that all of our devs should have eventually and and I think it's kind of a priority because that that way when whenever we build something we are we're ready to do it we know how it's going to work so so that would yeah, be I would, I would love to build a build one of the that's actually, I, I got rid of, I had a Taz for a while, and I kind of gave it all to some people that thought we needed a little bit more. Uh -huh. uh, but, yeah, with the goal of eventually building one of these, uh, one of the D3Ds, so I'd love to be able to you know, replicate one pretty soon here. It looks like yeah. it's a couple hundred dollars in parts, right? Yeah, it should be about 300, uh, 300 or so. Uh, and I have a MIG welder now, so it does make it right some stuff here. yeah the metal frame is in one off it might cost more but you can do it in in the the pvc which is um uh, we're going forward with that john is working on a pvc version we just really got to test it and and make it uh we know we could make it work it's we might have to strengthen it even by doing like filling it with cement or something but uh, that should be quite workable it's a really good idea for going if you say we're doing a remote workshop uh, it's hard to get take all that metal, but you can buy PVC locally, and then you have the PVC corners that have you make thought it about because you know, the construction is basically like two or what? It's like five squares, right? Yeah. Five kind of uh, squares with the square cut out in the center. Yep. Um, thought about just making an assembly of like basically a bunch of like strip. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Just flat. That's yeah. that's yeah, well, definitely. Well, that would be if you've got a MIG welder for someone who's yeah. versed at welding or spot welding even yeah that's yeah. absolutely doable and then you can have strip that you can buy locally and at that point the material waste is zero except um, the advantage of the CNC cut route is you can do the holes if you if you're attaching the axes not by magnets but by um, by bolts then you can get the bolts in there with the CNC so so there's advantages and disadvantages but definitely for a low-cost version the strip and easily accessible materials this the frame made out of strip is quite doable um, yeah. yeah it's completely That's doable I, I thought it would be a nice version uh, to try out yeah yeah uh, that would be recommended to try that I mean it would take much more time to build the frame because you gotta now yeah. instead of having that cut by by a CNC shop you have to first cut the pieces to length and then t weld them together so and then grind that stuff so it's going to be much more time but um but it's worth that was how we built the power cube though you know um exactly the one we did for the, the right tractor. right exactly and that's that's why it took much longer than it sh than it could yeah. but yeah it's definitely doable and we should document like for if say we're building the 3d printer frames which are very uniform they're you know they're all the same pieces there then uh, it's worth knowing how much time that takes you know compared to okay how much does it take to cut a frame on a CNC torch table versus how to how much by hand using the strips so we should have data on that uh, that would be a good data point to to go forward with because then we can yeah, we can be knowledgeable about exactly what it takes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely worthwhile to, to document that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, and then on the as far as the B three D, you were saying that I haven't seen the design with the holes. Uh, the holes in that yeah, because we never really got to that point of actually drawing that. That that needs to be updated. So maybe if you if you do do that, 
Um, we don't have a version where we actually show the the whole locations because all the frames we got before we were using using magnets to do that and then it turned out people really hate the magnets I mean that's just after a couple of those workshops people just could not do the magnets because they would jump out on you it's too hard to put them in so um, so definitely we want to do a bolt hole through the frame so but we just didn't get to a, the cat of that so if you could do that that would be that would be good so that means an, an accurate model the key part to, to the modeling which is what we're going with Jonathan is working not John, Jonathan but John John is working on that but the key point is to make sure that after everything is said and done you can tell from the cat exactly how where the nozzle moves to so you can know exactly what what area print area you have available that's the that's the tricky part because uh, you can definitely build it but then you you'll find out oh I can only use so much of my print area cuz it's not designed right that that needs to be catted up for for it for you not to uh, have a crappy design crappy build because you can definitely build it and you can get right into it but you definitely want to do the CAD so you you're actually using the full bed instead of a part of it yeah where did you did you run into that with the previous version or there are still issues on that uh, like on the well on the previous version that was kind of easy because we could shift the axis because they were magnet magnetically connected so we just shifted like from side to side a little bit um, and then we would make it fit but definitely like on the if we have the 8 inch version yeah you have to work that out definitely we're not using we don't have the optimized version right now you can make little changes in the design like use little spacers and, and things like that to make it fit better but that we have not optimized for for print area like the complete optimization from print area we might be missing like an inch on one side or something like that or an inch on the other and if we're doing right now we're also doing the 12 inch print bed version so that's a totally different story than an 8 inch so um. yeah I mean keeping the the nice thing about the D3D is just the, the lack of unique parts you know uh, a lot of the, the yeah. yep. printers out there on, on the rep wrap like you've just gotten crazy in the number of parts yeah it's like, yeah that's true Including like what Lex was saying about the latest Prusa i3 MK3, they just got so many more parts than the last version. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's and it's a good printer. I mean, I was really impressed with it, but uh, it's it's also just not very re replicable. You know, it's like. Um, yeah, I heard it takes 16 hours if you're an expert, about 40 hours if you're a first-time builder. For the kit or for the. Uh, for the uh, kit, if you buy a kit, uh, yeah. one who's really savvy with printers, you, it takes you 16 hours. If you're a beginner, it's all week. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, it'll be great if you can uh, do that. And then, like, as you're going forward on it, I mean, yeah, maybe just, uh, I mean, if you could do the you know get the detour onto a 3d printer but then you actually get a real scale model to prototype this that would be that would be valuable yeah that would be preferred because that's that's part of the stuff we should be doing it's just we don't have enough energy enough human power to to get all those steps done yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yep yeah a lot of that's just getting enough enough man hours uh, working on the project the, yeah. Put the, the top twenty of all time up there, and it's uh, um, yeah, it's clear who's working on this full time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's good to keep track of that so we know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Well, sounds good. Yeah. So yeah, yeah let's. Kind of the there. Yeah. That sounds good. So yeah, if you could get back right into it, that'd be awesome. And we can, when when we're ready, we can, we can take a look at a date for a build. And then, yeah. So let's let's cut it off here. And then the next meeting next week, same time, Tuesday at two p.m. So we'll see you there, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye.